Chapter 13 of The Air Lords of Han by Philip Francis Nolan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 Escape. We had little time, however, to waste in endearments, and very little to devote to informing me as to the American plans. The essential thing was that I report the Han plans and resources to the fullest of my ability, and for an hour or two I talked steadily giving an outline of all I had learned from San Lan and his counselors, and particularly of the arrangements for drawing off the population of the city to new cities concealed underground, through the system of tunnels radiating from the base of the mountain. And as a result, the Americans determined to speed up their attack. There were, as a matter of fact, only two relatively small commands facing the city, Wilma told me, but both of them were picked troops of the new Federal Council. Those to the south were a division of veterans who a few weeks before had destroyed the Han city of St. Louis. St. Louis. On the east were a number of the Colorado gangs and an expeditionary force of our own Wyomings. The attack on Lotan was intended chiefly as an attack on the morale of the Hans of the other twelve cities. If there seemed to be a chance of victory, the operations were to be pushed through. Otherwise, the object would be to do as much damage as possible and fade away into the forest if the Hans developed any real pressure with their new infantry and field batteries of rocket guns and disintegrator rays. The air balls were simply miniature swoopers of spherical shape, ultronically controlled by operators at control boards miles away, but who saw on their viewplates whatever picture the ultronic television lens in the sphere itself picked up at the predetermined focus. The main propulsive rocket motor was diametrically opposite the lens, so that the sphere could be steered simply by keeping the picture of its objective centered on the crossed hairlines of the viewplates. The outer shell moved magnetically as desired with respect to the core, which was gyroscopically stabilized. Auxiliary rocket motors enabled the operator to make a sphere move sideways, backward, or vertically. Some of these spheres were equipped with devices which enabled their operators to hear as well as see through their ultronic broadcasts, and most of those which had invaded the interior of Lo Tan were equipped with speakers, in the hope of finding me and establishing communication. Still others were equipped for two-stage control. That is, the operator control led the vision sphere, and through it watched and steered an air torpedo that traveled ahead of it. The Han airship, or any other target selected by the operator of such a combination, was doomed. There was no escape. The spheres and torpedoes were too small to hit. They could travel with the speed of bullets. They could trail a ship indefinitely, hover a safe distance from their mark, and strike at will. Finally, neither darkness nor smoke screens were any bar to their ultronic vision. The spheres which had penetrated and explored Lotan in their search for me had floated through breaches in the walls and roofs made by their advanced torpedoes. Wilma had just finished explaining all this to me, when I heard a noise outside my door. With a whispered warning, I flung myself back on the couch and simulated unconsciousness. When I did not answer the poundings and calls to open, a police detail broke in and shook me roughly. The air ball, I moaned, pretending to regain consciousness slowly. It came in from the corridor. Look what it did to the guard. It must have grazed my head. Where is it? Gone muttered the under-officer, looking fearfully around. Yes, undoubtedly gone. These men have been dead some time. And this pistol, the ball got him before he had a chance to use it. See, it has beamed through the wall only here, where he dropped it. Who are you? You look like a tribesman. Oh, yes, you're the heaven-born special prisoner. Maybe I ought to beam you right now. Good thing. Everyone would call it an accident. By the grand dragon, I will. While he was talking, I had staggered to the other side of the room to draw his attention away from the couch where the ball was concealed. Now suddenly the pillows burst apart, and a blanket with which I had covered the thing streaked from the couch, hitting the man in the small of the back. I could hear his spine snap under the impact. Then it shot through the air toward the group of soldiers in the doorway, bowling them over and sending them shrieking right and left along the corridor. Relentlessly and with amazing speed it launched itself at each in turn, until the corpses lay grotesquely strewn about, and not one had escaped. 
it returned to me for all the world like an old-fashioned ghost, the blanket still draped over it, and not interfering with its ultronic vision in the least, and stood before me. "'The yellow devils are going to kill you, Tony,' I heard Wilma's voice saying. "'You've got to get out of there, Tony, before you are killed. Besides, we need you at the control boards, where you can make real use of your knowledge of the city. Have you your jumping belt, ultraphone, and rocket gun?' No, I replied, they are all gone. It would be no good for you to try to make your way to one of the breaches on the wall, nor to the roof, she mused. No, they are too well guarded, I replied. And even if you made a new one at a predetermined spot, I'm afraid the repairmen and the patrol would go to it ahead of me. Yes, and they would beam you before you could climb inside of a swooper, she added. I'll tell you what I can do, Wilma, I suggested. I know my way about the city pretty well. Suppose I go down one of the shafts to the base of the mountain. I think I can get out. It is dark in the valley, so the Hans cannot see me, and I will stand out in the open where your ultrascopes can pick me up. Then a swooper can drop quickly down and get me. Good, Wilma said. But take that Hans disintegrator pistol with you, and go right away, Tony. But wrap this ball in something and carry it with you. Just toss it from you if you are attacked. I'll stay at the control board and operate it in case of emergency. So I picked up the ball and pistol, and thrust the hand in which I held it into the loose Han blouse I wore, wrapped the ball in a piece of sheeting, and stepped out into the corridor, hurrying toward the nearest magnetic car station, a couple of hundred feet down the corridor, for I had to cross nearly the entire width of the city to reach the shaft that went to the base of the mountain. I thanked Providence for the perfection of the Han mechanical devices when I reached the station, the automatic checking system of these cars made station attendance unnecessary. I had only to slip the key I had taken from the dead Han officer into the account charting machine at the station to release a car. Pressing the proper combinations of main and branch line buttons, I seated myself, holding the pistol ready but concealed beneath my blouse. The car shot with rapid acceleration down the narrow tunnel. The tubes in which these magnetic cars which slid along a few inches above the floor of the tunnel by localized repeller rays. Ran were very narrow, just the width of the car, and my only danger would come if on catching up with another car its driver should turn around and look in my face. If I kept my face to the front and hunched over so as to conceal my size, no driver of a following car would suspect that I was not a Han like himself. The tube dipped under traffic as it came to a trunk line, and my car magnetically lagged until an opening in the traffic permitted it to swing swiftly into the main line tunnel. At the automatic distance of ten feet, it followed a car in which rode a scantily clad girl, her flimsy silks fluttering in the rush of air. I cursed my luck. She would be far more likely to turn around than a man, to see if a man were in the car behind, and if he were personable, for not even the impending doom of the city and the public demoralization caused by the air balls had dulled the proclivities of the Han women for brazen flirtation, and turn around she did. Before I could lower my head, she had seen my face and knew I was no Han. I saw her eyebrows arch in surprise, but she seemed puzzled rather than scared. Before she could make up her mind about me, however, her car had swung out of the main tunnel on its predetermined course, and my own automatically was closing up the gap to the car ahead. The passenger in this one wore the uniform of a medical officer, but he did not turn around before I swung out of the main traffic to the little station at the head of the shaft. This particular shaft was intended to serve the very lowest levels exclusively, and since its single car carried nothing but express traffic, it was used only by repairmen and other specialists who occasionally had to descend to those levels. There were only three people on the little platform, which reminded me very much of the subway stations of the 20th century. Two men and a girl stood facing the gate of the shaft, waiting for the car to return from below. One of these was a soldier, apparently off-duty, for though he wore the scarlet military coat, he carried no weapons other than his knife. The other man wore nothing but sandals and a pair of loose short pants of some heavy and serviceable material. I did not need to look at the compact tool kit, and the ray machines attached to his heavy belt, nor the gorgeously jeweled armlet and diadem that he wore to know him for a repairman. The girl was quite scantily clad, but wore a mask, 
which was not unusual among the Han women when they went forth on their flirtatious expeditions. And there was something about the sinuous grace of her movements that seemed familiar to me. She was making desperate love to the repairman, whose attitude toward her was that of pleased but lofty tolerance. The soldier, who was seeking no trouble, occupied himself strictly with his own thoughts and paid little attention to them. I stepped from my car, still carrying my bundle in which the air ball was concealed, and the car shot away as I threw the release lever over. Not so successful as the soldier in simulating lack of interest in the amorous girl and her companion, I drew from the latter a stare of haughty challenge, and the girl herself turned to look at me through her mask. She gasped as she did so, and shrank back in alarm, and I knew her then in spite of her mask. She was the favorite of the heaven-born himself. Nagaulan! I exclaimed before I could catch myself. At the mention of her name, the soldier's head jerked up quickly, and the girl herself gave a little cry of terror, shrinking against her burly companion. This would mean death for her if it reached the ears of her lord. And her companion, arrogant in his immunity as a repairman, hesitated not a second. His arm shot out toward the soldier who was nearer to him than I. There was the flash of a knife blade, and the soldier sagged on his feet, then tumbled over like a sack of potatoes. And before my mind had grasped the danger, he had swept the girl aside and was springing at me. That I lived for a moment even was due to the devotion of my wife Wilma, who somewhere in the mountains to the east was standing loyally before the control board of the air ball I carried. For even as the Han leapt at me, the bundle containing the air ball which I had placed at my feet shot diagonally forward, catching the fellow in the middle of his leap, hurling him back against the grilled gate of the elevator shaft and pinning his lifeless body there. An instant the girl gazed in speechless horror at what had been her secret lover, then she threw herself at my feet, writhing and shrieking in terror. At this moment, the elevator shot to a sudden stop behind the grill, and prepared for the worst, I faced it, disintegrator pistol raised. But I lowered the pistol at once with a sigh of relief. The elevator was empty. For a moment I considered. I dared not leave either of these bodies nor the girl behind in descending the shaft. At any moment other passengers might glide out of the tunnel to take the elevator and give an alarm. So I played the beam of the pistol for an instant on the two dead bodies. They vanished, of course, into nothingness, as did part of the station platform. The damage to the platform, however, would not necessarily be interpreted as evidence of a prisoner escaping. Then I threw open the elevator gate, dragging Nagao Lan into the car and stifling her hysterical shrieks, pressed the button that caused it to shoot downward. In a few moments I stepped out several thousand feet below into a shaft that ran toward one of the valley gates. The pistol again became serviceable, this time for the destruction of the elevator, thus blocking any possible pursuit, yet without revealing my flight. The Gaulan fought like a cat, but despite her writhing, scratching, and biting, I bound and gagged her with her own clothing, and left her lying in the tunnel while I stepped in a car and shot toward the gate. As the car glided swiftly along the brilliantly lit but deserted tunnel, I conversed again with Wilma through the metallic speaker of the air ball. The only obstacle now, I told her, is the massive gate at the end of the tunnel. The gate guard, I think, is posted both outside and inside the gate. In that case, Tony, she replied, I will shoot the ball ahead and blow out the gate. When you hear it bump against the gate, throw yourself flat in the car, for an instant later I will explode it. Then you can rush through the gate into the night. Scout ships are now hovering above, and they will see you with their ultrascopes, though the darkness will leave you invisible to the Hans. With this, the ball shot out of the car and flashed away, down the tunnel ahead of me. I heard a distant metallic thump and crouched low in the speeding car, clapping my hands to my ears. The heavy detonation which followed struck me like a blow and left me gasping for breath. The car staggered like a living thing that had been struck, then gathered speed again and shot forward toward the gaping black hole where the gate had been. I brought it to a stop at the pile of debris and climbed through this to freedom in the night. Stumblingly, I made my way out into the open and waited. Behind, and far above me on the mountain peak, the lights of the city gleamed and flashed, while the iridescent beams of countless disintegrator ray batteries on surrounding mountain peaks played continuously and nervously, crisscrossing the sky above it. 
Then with a swish, a line dropped out of the sky, and a little seat rested on the ground beside me. I climbed into it, and without further ado was whisked up into the swooper that floated a few hundred feet above me. An hour later, I was deposited in a little forest glade where the headquarters of the Wyoming gang were located, and was greeted with a frantic disregard for decorum by the deputy boss of the Wyomings, who rushed upon me like a whirlwind, laughing, crying, and whispering endearments all in the same breath, while I squeezed her, Wilma, my wife, until at last she gasped for mercy. End of chapter 13